complete our uh, discussion on constitutive equations by taking some very specific examples of this strain energy function. Uh, this we had already discussed, but anyway for the sake of completeness, let us uh, do that and do a simple problem to understand how we apply, not the finite element problem, but, on a, but, uh, but an example problem to see how we apply uh, these models. As I told you, one of the most, uh, uh, I would say, important model is the Ogden model and uh, we have already seen that uh, most of these models uh, can express the strain energy function in terms of the, what are they, stretch lambda 1, lambda 2 and lambda 3. So a general model of Ogden is given by this equation, so psi is equal to, so that is the equation that you use to define the Ogden model. There may be a small variation, in fact, uh, if you look at Abacus, I think there is a small variation as to how this is done, but nevertheless, there are two constants mu p alpha p and this p varies from 1 to n. In other words, when I expand this, you will get mu 1 alpha 1, mu 1 by alpha 1 into this plus mu 2 alpha 2 into lambda 1 alpha, alpha 2 plus and so on. So you will get a set of mu p alpha p functions p is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4 or 5. So in, in other words, this n is in your hands. What is the n that you choose? Usually it has been found that when you choose n is equal to 3, when this n equal to 3, you get very good results in the sense that the strain energy functions that you get out of n is equal to 3 are able to express the uh, or, uh, or they are able to meet the values obtained from experiments. So most people use n is equal to 3 in order to calculate mu p and alpha p. But there is a bit of a warning that I want to give here because if you look at uh, most of these softwares, the software asks for stress strain curves and then you will be able to give the stress strain curve and the uh, program fits these values. Most cases, because of lack of availability of data or whatever it is, we give only a uniaxial tension case. Okay, so uh, this is what you do, an, uh, an experiment you do with the uniaxial tension case and then you give this stress strain curve and ask the program to fit mu p alpha p data. Okay, usually that is what is done. But this is not adequate. Actually, the mu p and alpha p should be arrived at when say when n is equal to 3 should be arrived at from not only a tension data, but also at least a biaxial tension and shear. These are also required in order to fit these parameters properly. In fact, there are a lot of anomalies not only in finite element, and finite element is a difficult task, we are going to see that also, but also the definition of the property values itself, the property value itself. For example, we have found uh, in, I mean, the experience that a tension curve may not be reflected about the center point for compression. In other words, there may even be difference between tension curve and compression curves. Okay? Then the, the data that it fits when you give that together is different from when you give only the tension curve. Okay, so, when you give a biaxial curve, then it is different and so on. 
but it's unfortunate that people do not spend lot of time in getting this data they do not want to do it so the, they just take value say for example they take a typical this is a typical value doesn't mean doesn't mean this is the these are the values okay that can be used for any rubber it's a typical value of the coefficients okay but people just use this kind of value and expect to get a result you will get a result but may not be the correct result so the key to the success of uh, finite element for uh, finite element analysis of elastomeric components <laughs> is the correct definition of the mechanical behavior through such constants like mu p and alpha p okay fortunately most softwares give or have the ability to fit this kind of curves okay for example mark has it abacus has it and all that but please note that you can't take a default value into a problem now as i told you in the last class we can divide the whole problem of uh, this kind of um, the hyperelastic material as compressible or incompressible hyperelastic material incompressible hyperelastic materials also to a certain extent uh, consider or take into account nearly incompressible hyperelastic materials for uh, let let's do a small problem to understand uh, what we mean by pressure term and how we actually calculate pressure just take down a problem consider an incompressible consider an incompressible hyperelastic membrane that is subjected to biaxial deformation that means that say a sheet is taken and the sheet is subjected to biaxial deformation membrane that means very thin sheet plain stress problem okay subjected to a biaxial deformation assume of course the plain stress state and specify the cauchy stress or in other words find out the cauchy stress sigma 1 and sigma 2 using the ogden model in other words develop a relationship between sigma 1 and sigma 2 and stretch lambda 1 lambda 2 and of course lambda 3 which you can get as a function of lambda 1 and lambda 2 right let's see how you do this problem one of the first things that i have stated is that the material is incompressible hyperelastic correct hyperelastic incompressible material so that means that my lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda 3 should be equal to 1 so that lambda 3 is equal to lambda 1 lambda 2 whole power minus 1 let us see how we do this problem we start from our general relationship in fact most times such general relationships are used to calculate the stresses even in finite element analysis okay now so that's the general relationship now in this relationship what you do is that is now defined by the ogden model so you calculate this part this part from the ogden model which means that take this okay differentiate that with respect to lambda delta lambda a and then substitute this into that expression is that clear so this is where various di uh, or uh, different types of material models come into picture the other material models are we, before we proceed we'll just look at other material models the other material models are what are called as muni rivlin model muni rivlin model look at the way muni rivlin model is associated with 
the Ogden model. When n becomes 2, alpha 1 is equal to 2 and alpha 2 is equal to minus 2, then we reduce the Ogden model or Ogden model gets reduced to the muni rivlin model. Though there are, uh, uh, there is a lot of theory behind it, I am not going to the details of it. Um, it is, it is not that muni rivlin is just like that obtained from here, but this is one of the relationship, but muni rivlin has its own theory behind it as well as what is called as a neo hookian model. <laughs> When, when we have n is equal to 1 and alpha 1 is equal to 2, we reduce this to neo hookian model. neo hookian model usually as you, as you can see, the level of sophistication is quite low when compared to if you call that a sophistication in the sense that when n is larger. These uh, class of neo hookian uh, rubber material models are good or elastomeric material models are good to look at not very, very large deformations, but moderate deformations, you can get away with it by using neo hookian models. Now, uh, you may ask me a question, if I, if, if I have that kind of an Ogden model, which encompasses all these models, why should I come, come down to neo hookian or muni The answer is very simple, because there you have to calculate mu p and alpha p as you in keep increasing p, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, suppose 5, look at how many constants you have to calculate. That means that the test data that is required is also quite large. So many times it may so happen that the deformations are not very large, okay. it is still in the large deformation trend, but, but moderate, moderately large, okay. 7, 8, 10 percent maximum. So in which case you can use, get away with using a much simpler model where your calculations are reduced to only one constant and your calculations here reduced to two constants and so on. So you sort of make an assumption in N1 and in fact this is this new hook N is just not just a reduction, you know, it is also based on some concepts of statistical mechanics, that is the reason why this seems to work. Okay. So, you can uh, sort of use these simplified versions of the Ogden model and then uh, get away with it. Many people use uh, Muni Rivlin models to a great extent, okay, that, that seem to work for many problems. Okay, but uh, again, there is no one prescription to say that use always Ogden model and so on. This is one area where your knowledge of finite element is not sufficient. Knowledge of also the material behavior of these kind of elastomers or biological specimens or whatever it is, is as well, is important as well. So you have to know what models to use. As I told you, uh, just I do not mind repeating it, that there are models like your model, which has very specific application in carbon filled rubber, it is used for say tire analysis. The, these are latest models, these are 50s model, and this is in the 90s model. Okay. But the procedure is the same, you need not worry about it. The procedure is the same, it is just plug and play concept. All the concepts which we have seen is the same. Only thing is that the expressions keep changing. Of course, I have not done lot more thing than, you know, uh, than what is required. For example, there are certain relationship between static models and this model. In other words, uh, with uh, our linear elastic case, there is a relationship between them. This comes about because of certain restrictions, further restrictions that you have to put on the strain energy function. Okay, I am not going to the details of it. For example, for uh, Ogden model, you can see that sigma of alpha p mu p is equal to 2 mu where mu is the shear modulus of the static case, so that is uh, in the sense that of the reference state or for small strain case. Okay, so we call this as the base state, we will call this as base state, uh, that is just at the point where you apply a small deformation, then the shear modulus, what you calculate from your uh, small strain case 
is equal to alpha p mu p and so on. There is a reason behind this, why this comes about. This is because w 1 comma 1 or uh, strain energy mu uh, psi 1 comma 1 comma 1 should be equal to 0. Also, the, the there are some other uh, conditions uh, as well. We will not go into the details of it. Just I want to state that this kind of conditions are also required. Now, let us come back to this problem, what we had just defined for a plane stress problem where we have a biaxial tension case. Right. Now, since I had already defined that as to be a plane stress problem, so automatically sigma 3 is equal to 0. So, look at how I am calculating pressure or else pressure cannot be uh, is indeterminate, cannot be determined. Due to this kind of conditions, either boundary condition or this kind of behavioral conditions that you calculate P. So, sigma 3 is equal to 0 in this case, so kinematic condition that comes about. That is equal to 0 means that minus P plus P is equal to 1 to N <coughs> mu P lambda 3 whole power alpha P lambda 3 power alpha P and that is 0. So, from which I can get P in this fashion. Right. Now, substituting that into the expression when A is equal to 1, you get sigma 1. So, sigma 1 can be written as of course, minus P plus P is equal to 1 to N mu P lambda 1 power alpha P, which say in this case P happens to be this and that is when substituted here, you will get this. Now, if I now put lambda 3 is equal to lambda 1, lambda 2 whole power minus 1 or 1 by yeah, this because I had put as the condition as why is this equal to 1? Because we had put incompressible. I told that they are incompressible, incompressible hyperelastic material, and that is the reason why we had put lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 is equal to 1. <coughs> yeah, that is correct. So, from there I substitute back into this expression and then into this expression, this expression, and I get this form. So, this is a straightforward calculation of stress knowing the type of strain energy function. Is that clear? Now, having studied, yes, I, do, I will not uh, claim fully at least to a great extent what different terminologies mean in uh, the constitutive equations as well as continuum mechanics we will get back to the finite element part of it. The whole idea of teaching this maybe in the, ten, in the last 10, 12 classes is to understand all the terminologies that will be necessary in order to even talk the language of finite deformation elasticity. Now, uh, I, I do not claim that what I am going to teach is good enough to implement completely a nonlinear finite element code because that goes a long way still. Okay, there are things which you have to work out, but you will have all the background if you want to look at a paper and study, you will have all the background to understand how a nonlinear finite element analysis works. Uh, in my opinion, one of the major problems with nonlinear finite element is that people do not even understand the manuals that are given with the softwares whether you use abacus or mark or ansys or whatever it is for nonlinear finite elements people don't even understand the the terminologies that are given in the manuals people don't even understand if they, if he says stretch based element people don't even understand what stretch is so the reason why i did all this is because at least you will be able to understand i mean the commercial codes even if you want to use it Commercial codes for nonlinear finite element cannot be used blindly. You cannot just take a code because if he asks you, are you using Ogden model? If you do not know what is Ogden model, 
where it comes in the theory, to where it fits in. What is this alpha p mu p? If you ask for alpha p and mu p, and he is going to ask you, are you going to use n is equal to three or n is equal to five? If you don't even know that, you are not going to use. Forget about writing codes. You are not even going to use a finite element code. And definitely, you have to use this kind of Mooney Rivlin, Neo Hookian, or this thing. And and you would call general polynomial expression for psi for the strain energy. Then you should know at least what these things mean. Okay, and he would also talk about what we are going to say now for total Lagrangian, the updated Lagrangian. Okay, having completed all this, we'll get back to the finite element form. Yes, I have not done one aspect. Yeah, I, I know it will be very useful, but due to lack of time, one is uh, what we, what we require. What we're going to require now. I'm, I'm going to say that what we call as the incremental, uh, you know, reduction of many of these things. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what it is uh, as I go along, but we do not have time to get that. Again, that is a topic where we have to go through for next four or five classes. Because of lack of time, we are not going to cover it. But I think it will not be very difficult. It will not be very difficult for you to uh, derive or catch that. But one thing again I would like to warn you is that there are very many algorithms in uh, nonlinear finite elements. It would be impossible for in any class to cover all of them. It is it's almost impossible. There are so many papers that are coming out recently on so many formulations. Now, if you look at stretch, for example, people people also work with logarithmic stretch and so on. Okay, because of the ease with which you can implement certain things, people work with Cij or people work with lambda or the natural logarithm of lambda and so on. So people work with different types of strain measures in order to express the strain energy function. But doesn't doesn't deviate from what we have done, but the expressions, the algebraic expressions that are involved are going to be different, not different. Again you have to calculate the same gradient with respect to lambda or whatever it is. But the expressions will be different. So I, I that is one of the things that I want to warn you because it, it, it is almost impossible in a course to cover the whole gamut of nonlinear finite elements. The same way, say, we are going to talk about mixed formulation. There is so much of theory behind mixed formulation that it would be impossible for us to cover all those kind of things. We, we will, anyway, by the end of the course, you will be aware that these are the things that exist. Okay, when someone when you read a paper, someone gives you that this is the formulation. You will understand where you stand. Okay, maybe algebra you may have to work out separately. Okay, with that background, let us come back to the finite element formulation in finite deformation. In fact, if you look at the finite element formulations in finite deformation, whatever we have done with respect to finite deformation, you can immediately say that I can approach this problem in two fashions. One is to look at what we called as the material coordinates or to express all these coefficients or functions or whatever it is in terms of material coordinates or in terms of spatial coordinates. In other words, it may be possible to express the whole of these things in terms of a Lagrangian formulation or Eulerian formulation. Eulerian formulation is the current co configuration and Lagrangian formulation is the reference configuration. Fine. But we are going to deviate a bit from these two and have some sort of a middle path. Note this carefully. The Lagrangian formulations straight away are called as total Lagrangian formulation or in other words, if you formulate the whole problem in terms of the reference configuration, you call the finite element formulations based on all the quantities which are given in terms of reference configuration, you call that as the total Lagrangian formulations.
total Lagrangian formulation. Number one. That means that the reference configuration is not updated. You have one reference configuration and that reference configuration which is defined in terms of x1, x2 and x3, the points there, okay, that configuration stays. You do not update. There is another formulation which is not actually spatial coordinate formulation called as the updated Lagrangian formulation. People give different names to this. If you look at books by Belishko and Crisfield, they call this as an updated Lagrangian formulation. If you look at books like Zinkiewicz, he calls this as current configuration formulation. But there is a difference between the current configuration or updated Lagrangian formulation and Eulerian formulation, though the difference is very subtle. In other words, you may be wondering why did I introduce an updated Lagrangian or a total Lagrangian, okay, one based on the reference configuration, the other based on the current within quotes, we will define what current is. Why have we introduced new terms? Why not I just call this as Lagrangian formulation and why not I call this as an Eulerian formulation? This is a subtle difference. Of course, Lagrangian formulation is called total Lagrangian formulation. In the updated Lagrangian formulation, the configuration, the reference configuration is updated to get to the converged value of the configuration. All of you know now that we march in terms of time steps. Of course, we are going to use newton raphson method, there is no doubt about it. So, we will march in terms of time step, which means that we are going to be, the loads are going to be given in terms of pseudo times T1, T2, say up to Tn t n plus 1 and so on until we exhaust the whole of the loads okay, for a static problem. Then if I am say in t n and then you, I want to go over to t n plus 1, right? then let us let's say that we start with say t 0, t 0 is the place where we start this reference configuration, t 0 is equal to 0 is the actual state. Then in the updated Lagrangian formulation, we update this configuration by adding to this x, say calculating x, adding to this x, the say the displacements that has happened up to t n. Okay, this is updated. Though this is called current configuration, actually it is not a current configuration. I hope you understand the difference. It is not current configuration. Current configuration is an instantaneous configuration at time say t. When, when I am going from t n plus t n to t n plus 1, actually at any time t between these two, that configuration is current configuration. That is the Eulerian configuration. But here what you do is, you keep updating the configuration you will see why you are doing it when it, you keep updating the configuration okay, and treat as if the reference configuration at T n is equal to this updated configuration. So, this is quite called updated Lagrangian formulation. Yeah, any questions? Can you use the mic? Uh, not displacement, we are updating the coordinates. Yeah, so actually, uh, uh, since we are, we are into finite element regime, you can say that we are updating the coordinates, say x1, x2, x3 of say a node, say 5. Yes, the element shapes are different. That is in the sense that the element may get deformed. So, you are into another configuration where the element shape has changed. Then shape function has to change. 
Shape function is anyway we are using isoparametric formulation. So we are using all the time isoparametric formulation. So let me let me uh, tell this very clearly. I mean this is usually the confusion many people have. Though if you look at a textbook, the isoparametric formulation comes in the sixth chapter. Okay, you talk about so many other things before you come to isoparametric formulation. Let me assure you that every code uses isoparametric formulation only. Okay, so whenever we talk about any of these things, they are straight away extension of the isoparametric formulation which you had studied in the earlier class. Right? There is no doubt. Let me make it very clear. When you talk about integration schemes here, they are the same as that you had studied in your previous classes. When you are talking about shape functions here in terms of psi eta or tau or whatever it is, 2D or 3D, then again they are the same as what you had done in your earlier classes. So the isoparametric concepts are valid and are just extended okay, to the finite deformation form. But the B matrix and all those things have, are going to change. Right. So strictly speaking updated Lagrangian is not an Eulerian formulation. Okay, but just that the configuration is updated. There are several advantages with this. We will see what they are as we go on. But it does not mean again that all packages use updated Lagrangian. Packages also use total Lagrangian or they use updated Lagrangian. Many of them they use. Can you, can you just use the mic? Uh, so when we get uh, converged at the final value, that would be exactly equal to the either coordinate or uh, what do you say updated to Lagrangian? Like, so the updated Lagrangian coordinate uh, formulation we are assuming in between. So no, actually, okay, let me explain that again. Updated Lagrangian is not in between, it is not in, in between T0 and Tn, it is not in between. So suppose I have arrived at Tn, that is, in other words, I have converged value at Tn. What I do is I update the coordinates okay, of the configuration of the configuration and get to a new uh, within quotes reference configuration. Not it is actually not a reference configuration, but within quotes reference configuration which has stress strains and all that inbuilt into this. Okay, uh, so that is the difference. So that's why people are afraid to call this as an Eulerian uh, formulation. In Eulerian formulation, what happens is that the mesh remains the same. Okay, here mesh gets updated, but still it is current. So that, that's why there is a confusion between Eulerian and updated Lagrangian. So I. That's why I spent some time to explain it. In fact, if you look at Zinke-Weeks, you would not call this as updated. It, all formulations are with respect to the current. You would call this as current Lagrangian formulation. In other words, updated Lagrangian is a current configuration formulation. Now, you may have a question whether we have to use a total Lagrangian or updated Lagrangian and whether there is going to be any difference between them how do you choose one over the other and so on. Now if you look at the formulation, in fact I am going to go through first total Lagrangian and convert it into an updated Lagrangian, you would see that both the uh, formulations are the same. The only thing is to which configuration you refer to, whether for example the integrations that are involved are done with respect to the reference configuration or current configuration or in other words theoretically speaking both of them should give the same result. There should not be any doubts about it. But the difference is for a person who actually uh, does the coding, especially if you have a small deformation code and you want to convert this into a finite deformation code, then the amount of effort you put in, in total Lagrangian formulations are usually much more, much more than in the updated Lagrangian formulation. Hence, many people prefer to use updated Lagrangian formulation, though there are claims and counterclaims that 
in some situ situations one is better than the other and so on. Now, let us look at uh, first the total Lagrangian formulation. If you, if you see what we are going to go through, it will be exactly the same as what we had already seen. In other words, here again we are going to see, we are going to look at what is called as displacement based formulation, which is our regular uh, formulations which we had used in our earlier course, as well as mixed formulations. Both of them are used. Why does mixed formulations or why do mixed formulations become important in uh, finite deformation? The answer is very simple because many of the materials that you use in uh, the case of finite deformation are ones which are incompressible. In other words, these guys, these uh, materials when used with displacement formula based formulations have a tendency to lock. So, in order to avoid that we go to mixed formulation. We have already seen what mixed formulations is. Now, only thing is that the way we are going to look at the strain, the stresses are going to be different. Again to answer an age old question whether if I use mixed formulation for a situation which does not warrant it, where there is no mesh locking and so on. Will I get a better result than displacement based formulation? No, you will not get. Okay, the results should be the same, and this mixed formulation should reduce to a displacement form based formulation if it does not warrant that situation. So, let us go through now the maybe the first two steps or three steps, and we will continue in the next class. See how to do a total Lagrangian approach. The starting point is the same, we write the functional, but of course we assume the existence of strain energy and as I told you the whole difference is what is it that you use here. So, the integration is done over the original volume and write this as strain energy. So, if I want to, I will just change this notation to W, it is easier to understand from many papers. Okay, so, the, so that that will give you the strain energy term omega 0 minus the what we call as phi external term. This is due to the external uh, work done by the external forces or the potential that is lost rather due to external forces. And the phi external term of course consists of two terms again. One term is due to body forces see where I am integrating again that is with respect to the original uh, configuration into rho 0 u i b i t omega. So, this is the first term that is due to the body force term and the second term you have gamma this is the boundary again refer to the original boundary and this is equal to u i T i d gamma. Now, note two things. One is that look at this, this is the original rho 0. So, original rho 0 and look at these here capital, which means that we are referring to all these things with respect to the original configuration. So, what I am going to do is to use small letters i j k etcetera to mean the current configuration and we are going to use these capital letters to mean the reference configuration. Again you would see that this is the work done by the traction terms or the potential lost due to the traction terms lost by the traction terms and that you will see that this is referred to the original surfaces surface area. So, right away the concept is very simple. If I have to convert this to the current configuration say omega current configuration, what I have to do is to replace these terms by relevant terms which refer to the current configuration that is the only difference. Now, let me write the variation first variation of 
del phi. Now, uh, before that, let us also remember, you, you know it, I am just saying that this is the, this is a very general uh, statement and in fact, all of you know how to write S i j, S i j is the second P L Kirchhoff stress. Note that we have derived this already, this is equal to dou w by dou c i j. You know it, but anyway, I am just writing it there. So, writing this quite simple, omega 0, dou w by dou c i j colon delta c i j, that is the first term here, which is due to the internal uh, or the uh, rather due to the strain energy term minus delta phi external term and that first variation has to be 0. Note that again that this would be the starting point for our newton raphson scheme. Now, this can be replaced by the relationship between the second Peyer-Lockyer-Kirchhoff stress and W so that that can be written as delta C i j half of S i j delta C i j minus delta phi external terms. Of course, you know how to write the delta phi external terms is equal to omega 0 rho 0 delta u i b i d omega plus So, what you do is substitute this here is equal to 0. Okay. Now, I hope this is clear as I told you this would be the our starting point for our Newton Raphson scheme. Now, before we go to the Newton Raphson scheme, we have to look at certain new things that it is nothing new, but in the new terms that we had introduced, how the variation of these terms can be given. For example, we know that F, the deformation gradient tensor is a two point tensor. That means that it is written in terms of small i as well as capital. That is in other words, this is due to or this has contribution from both the current as well as reference configuration. But note again, you know, note this here that the the S i j has everything, this is an, this is a quantity which is belonging to the Lagrangian coordinate system. Okay. S i j is with respect, both of them should, is with respect to the capital letters. So, if I want to find out delta f, okay, how do I find out? Now, you know for example, that you can write for example, u i is equal to x i minus capital x i. Okay. So, in other words, if you want to write dou u i by dou x i, so you can write this as dou x i dou capital X i minus delta i that is if uh, depending upon let me write generally as j so that delta i j and so on. So, delta f i now can be from this, you can write this as in terms of delta u i as dou of delta u i by delta x i, okay. that would be the delta u or delta f i i term. In other words, this can be written as delta u i comma capital I. So that now delta phi, which consists of these two terms, the strain energy term and the external work term, these two term can now be written as by substituting this expression into uh, and, uh, and of course, I mean one more thing I forgot, maybe we will write that later. 
one more thing I have to do that what is C i j or C. Remember that C is the f transpose f. Okay, so that we have to also get delta C as well. How do you calculate delta C? So what I'm going to do is that having known how do I how I write delta f, and having known the expression for C, what I'm going to do is to write down delta C, okay, in terms of delta f from here substitute that into this expression and then do an integration by parts okay in order to get the final expression for delta phi you will you will see just now why i'm going to do that and maybe since it involves a couple of steps we will stop here and we will continue this in the next class so what essentially i'm going to do is to derive first the fundamental equations in terms of the integral notation, then go over to the matrix notation after putting forward the fundamental relationships between the discretized quantity okay, and the continuum quantity. So, we will stop here and we will continue it in the next class.